That song's a little boring, isn't it? <laughs> when Steve asked me to preach on the holiness of God, I was uh, a little bit apprehensive about it because obviously the locus classicus of biblical texts that teach this concept is Isaiah 6. And I was thinking that over the past 45 years, I've preached from that text literally scores of times. And I said the best, I said, my fear is that some of the people who will be here today may have heard me preach on that in one venue or another, and so I run the risk of boring you with repetition. And she said, well, honey, I've, I've heard every time that you've done it, and I never get bored with, with it because of the significance of the subject matter. And it is a matter that we need to hear about, not just once or twice, but again and again and again. So with your indulgence, I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, which is the biblical record of Isaiah's call to be a prophet. We read in chapter 6 and verse 1. Did you hear that, Steve? Yes, I know where I am. <laughs> I always tease them. I said, what is it about the Baptists that they, they always said I'm reading from chapter 8 and verse 32 instead of chapter 8, verse 32, the way the Presbyterians do it. And so, <laughs> so when in Rome do as the Romans do, and so I said, I'll read from chapter 6 and <laughs> verse 1, as redundant as that expression may be. <laughs> I want to hear the Baptist air conditioning going. You know what that is? Flipping of the pages of the Bible creates air currents that cool us all off. You don't find that in the Presbyterian churches either. Chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high, lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, <clears throat> Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I. Send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, their ears heavy, and blind their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. 
And then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until the cities lie waste without inhabitant, houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled, and the holy seed is its stump. Let's pray, shall we? Now, Father, the very words that we have just heard are too high, too holy for us to take in in their entirety. And so we ask this morning that you will be merciful to us, that you will send help by your Holy Spirit to minister to the frailty of our minds, the fragility of our understanding, that we may hear your word, that it may pierce our souls and our hearts. And after contemplating these things, may we never be the same again. For we ask it in Jesus' name, the Holy One of Israel. Amen. <clears throat> Before I look at this text, I want to just take a couple of minutes of theological prolegomena with you. One of the tasks that I had for many years in teaching in the seminary was to teach systematic theology one with its focus on what we call theology proper, or a study of the essence and character of God. And I can remember beginning my lectures to my students in a way that made me sound neo-Orthodox, because I spoke with paradox by saying, if you look at the doctrine of God as it's set forth in Reformed theology, you will see that it differs in no significant way from the doctrine of God that is confessed by virtually all Christian denominations, Lutherans, Episcopalians, Methodists, even Roman Catholics, whatever. Their creeds and confessions all list the same attributes of God, His eternality, His unity, His immutability, His sovereignty, His omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, and the like. And so on the one hand, there's nothing particularly unique about Reformed reform theology's doctrine of God. And yet on the other hand, from a different perspective, if you would ask me, what is the most unique dimension of Reformed theology, I would not hesitate to answer by saying, our doctrine of God. And they say, what, have you gone Bardian on us all of a sudden, that uh, you're thinking in dialectical terms? And I say, no. What I'm trying to get at is this. On the one hand, there's no significant difference in the content but the significant thing about Reformed theology is that when we get to page two of our systematic theology, we don't forget what we learned on page one, that it is our doctrine of God that drives and compels our understanding with respect to every other doctrine that we embrace. We can't understand the person and work of Christ apart from our understanding of the doctrine of God. We can't understand pneumatology, the person and work of the Holy Spirit, apart from our understanding of the doctrine of God. We can't understand harmatiology, our doctrine of sin, 
apart from our understanding of the doctrine of God. You can't understand soteriology apart from a correct understanding of the doctrine of God. And where all these elements of systematic theology go astray in various religious confessions, it's always because of a departure from some fundamental idea of our understanding of God himself. You spoke last night about our theology being theocentric. It is to be theocentric with a vengeance. Having said that, again, I want to speak briefly about an aspect of our understanding of God before I get to the text. And that is, of all of the attributes of God, the one I think is the most neglected in the church and even in the study of theology, and yet one that is of profound importance that we get correct in our thinking. It is the doctrine of the simplicity of God, his simplicitas. There's your Latin for the day. Probably come up with some more before we're done. And how many times have you preached on the simplicity of God? How many hours have you spent contemplating the significance of the simplicity of God? Well, when we speak of the simplicity of God, we're not saying, we're not talking about how easy God is, keeping it simple. No, no, no. When we talk about the simplicity of God, we're saying that God as God differs from all creatures in this respect, that his being is utterly simple and not compound or complex. You and I are compounded creatures. We are made up of various parts. We have different organs, different limbs, different aspects of our creaturely being. But there are no parts in God. God is not made up of 10% immutability and 15% omniscience or 60% eternality. No, but rather God is his attributes. Now what that means for us is that we can't take one attribute of God and set it against another one, as people do all the time. Whenever I preach on election, preach on the sovereignty of God, there is always the proverbial little old lady in the congregation who protests and says, my God is a God of love. As if the love of God trumped all of the rest of his attributes. Love excludes justice. Love prohibits wrath. And it's like we have a theological smorgasbord where we go with our plates and we go there and we help ourselves to a little grace, a little mercy, a whole lot of love, and we leave the justice and wrath and holiness on the table. I always want to say that the dear little lady, your God is a God of love. How many gods are there? Is there a God for you and a God for me and a God for everybody else? No, you can't do that. God is his attributes, and you can't set one attribute against another. So, for example, when we talk about his holiness and, say, his immutability, we understand from our study of God that God's immutability is a holy immutability. It is an eternal immutability. It is a singular immutability. And likewise, his holiness is an eternal holiness an immutable holiness, an omnipotent holiness, 
so that every attribute of God defines every other attribute of God in relation. And so we know at the outset, and this is why I'm taking this time, that we dare not establish a hierarchy of attributes in God and say that one is higher than another. But if we were to do that, (laughs) and we must not do it, but if we did, and look down at the abyss of heresy, (laughs) the one attribute that would immediately be exalted to the top would be the holiness of God. But rather than seeing holiness simply as an attribute of God, I think we need to understand it as the sum of the attributes of God, because holiness captures all that He is in every aspect of His being, in every aspect of His character. Now, with that in mind, Let's go to the text of Isaiah, which begins with a time frame reference of the call of Isaiah. He tells us simply, it was in the year that King Uzziah died. That means about the middle of the 8th century B.C. He doesn't say it was after King Uzziah died, although That idea seems to be suggested through the text, but he could simply mean by this historical reference is that the same year that Uzziah died was the year I was called to be a prophet. One of the great ironies of history is that the same year that King Uzziah died in Israel or in Judah, the same year that Isaiah received his call to the ministry who became the greatest messianic prophet of the Old Testament. A little village was established across the Mediterranean in the nation of Italy that was given the name Rome. It's one of the great ironies of history that the same year that God set apart this prophet to talk about the one who would come as the suffering servant to redeem his people by his providence of village who was established, that centuries later would reach the summit of conflict between the things of God and the forces of hell. Rome against the gospel. But it was in that year that King Uzziah died that Isaiah had his vision. If I were to give a pop quiz to the students of the Bible and say, who do you think would be listed in the top five kings of the Jewish people in their history? Who would you put on that list? Certainly everyone would include David, Certainly Josiah would be on that list. Probably Hezekiah. But on my list would have to be included Uzziah. Because if you look at the history of the kings, particularly the southern kingdom, you would see the one who came closest to David in extending the boundaries of the nation from Dan to Beersheba and establishing one of the mightiest armies in their period, and yet the one most famous for the public work projects that were completed under his ministration. And for the longevity of his reign, 52 years, Uzziah became king at age 16, and he reigned for 52 years. And until his latter years where he exhibited a Shakespearean flaw, a tragic fall, corruption in character. When he became swallowed up in his own pride, he wasn't satisfied with being the monarch. He wanted to be the priest king. And presumptuously, he enters into the holy place 
and usurps the right of the priests to offer the incense. He says, hey, I'm the king. I'll do that myself. You fellows take a walk. And the priest began to protest, saying, King, that's not your vocation. That's not your gift. God has separated us and consecrated us for that holy task, and you're out of line. And Uzziah became furious with the priest. And you know what happened? Right there in the holy place, God struck him with leprosy on his forehead. He was removed from the throne in shame, scandal, and disgrace, and replaced by his son Jotham, and he lived out his final days as a leper. And then he died. But for those who remembered the great days of Uzziah, it was a time of mourning. It was a sense of great loss. There was uncertainty of what would happen in the nation with a young king, basically an unknown quantity, on the throne. And it's under those circumstances, we're told, that Isaiah has this vision that changed his life. It's a vision that takes place in the temple, but we don't know whether it's in the earthly temple or in the heavenly temple. But it is the content of that vision that changed him and changed the world forever. The year that King Uzziah died, where everybody else was worried about the throne of Judea. He said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. And if you noticed in your translation, I'm sure, the vast majority of translations that are represented here, you will see that the word Lord is spelt capital L, little o, little r, little b. Whereas later on, in verse 3, you'll see that it's spelled capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. As you see it right here on the wall, all capital letters. Right? Now, what's the difference? Well, we know that characteristically, the translators, when they're rendering the Hebrew into our language, they have two different Hebrew words that are often translated by the English word Lord. And to call attention to which Hebrew word lies behind the translation, one is given in all capital letters and the other is given in capital L and then the rest lowercase letters. What's the difference? You read in the Psalm, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. It's O oh Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, our Lord, capital L, little O, little R, little D. Where you go to Psalm 110, the most frequently quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, D, said to my Lord, capital L, little O, little R, little D. Well, when you see Lord in all capital letters, you know what it means. That this is a translation of the ineffable memorial personal name of God, the name he revealed himself to Moses in the Midianite wilderness out of the burning bush, Yahweh, I am who I am. When you see capital L, little o, little r, little d, you're saying not the memorial name of God in the text, but you're saying the highest title 
given to God in the Old Testament. Based on the word Adon, Adonai, which being translated means the sovereign one, the one who is absolutely sovereign, the supreme ruler over heaven and earth. And so we need to see that here in the text because when there's a question of earthly rule in the minds of the people now at this time in their history, in that year, Isaiah said, I saw Adonai, the sovereign one. I didn't see Jotham, I didn't see Uzziah, I didn't see Josiah, I didn't see Hezekiah. I saw Adonai on the throne. Which, by the way, is the supreme title for God in the Old Testament that is given to Jesus in the New Testament. Have this mind among you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, took his equality with God, not as something to be jealously guarded or to be tenaciously held on to, but he emptied himself. Not of his attributes, God forbid. No kenosis. He emptied himself of his prerogatives. He emptied himself of his status. He emptied himself of his glory and willingly took upon himself the state of humiliation that goes with his incarnation and became a servant, obedient unto death. Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. And what is the name that is above every name? No, it's not Jesus. The name that is above every name that is given to Jesus is the name Curios, the Greek translation of Adonai. That is the name of Jesus, who now has this exalted title that belongs only to God. Every time you hear the name Jesus, who is now Adonai, Curios, every knee bows. Every tongue confesses that he is Adonai to the glory of God the Father. That's why some renditions and texts of the New Testament indicate that what was being envisioned here by Isaiah was the second person of the Trinity, the pre-incarnate Christ, perhaps. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high, lifted up, high in majesty, lifted up in exaltation, not just a matter of geographical suspension somewhere in the air, but I saw him in regal splendor with the refulgence of his glory emanating from him in this position. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Well, so what? Well, in the ancient world, the relative power and magnificence and munificence of various rulers were communicated by the fabric and the size of their royal gowns. Some wore wool gowns, others had chinchilla, others mink, others ermine with various precious dyes associated with them. But above all, it was the length of the robe that determined the status of the king. You know, I'm looking around this room, and there's some people in here old enough to remember where they were and what they were doing when they heard the news of the assassination of President Kennedy. How many of you? All right, at least a third of you. I can remember where I was and what I was doing when I heard the announcement of the death of FDR. How many of you can join me with that? Okay. How many remember the day Mussolini was killed? Yes. All right. 
But I also remember vividly the first transcontinental television production I ever saw and where I saw it. I saw it in Vesta's basement when I was in the eighth grade. We were excused from school to see this international event of such importance, the coronation of the beautiful young Princess Elizabeth to be the queen of Great Britain. And only the British have the skill at pomp and circumstance of any nation. And here, Elizabeth enters into Westminster Abbey for a coronation. And you see this spectacle of this young princess proceeding down the center aisle where the Archbishop of Canterbury is waiting. And she has a gown whose train is so long that it requires several pages to walk behind her, holding her gown as she comes. It's fantastic. The only thing that I remember seeing of, of, of like magnitude was when I stood at the front of the church in the sanctuary, standing next to the pastor and my best man, and I saw the back door open, and my bride began to walk down the aisle. How magnificent was the train of her wedding gown. But that was a subjective appreciation on my part. <laughs> you see, what Isaiah didn't see was Queen Elizabeth at her coronation. She saw Adonai high and lifted up where the train of his robe furled down over the side of his throne and continued out into the nave. And if there were pews, it would have enveloped and encompassed every pew, every square inch of the temple was filled by the heavenly robe of God. What a vision to see that. Above him stood the seraphim. With this anatomical description, each had six weeks, six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. Do you notice that when God makes creatures, he constructs them in a way that is fitting for their habitat. The natural habitat of birds is to fly through the air, and so God constructs them with light-weighted skeletons, with feathers, with wings, so that they can fly. And when he makes fish, he gives them gills, and fins and scales so that they can be suitable to the environment in which they live, which is in the water. And when he makes seraphim, he constructs them in a way that is fitting for their habitat. This was the habitat for angels, not for humanity. Because the location where the seraphim live is in the immediate presence of God, attending to the throne of God in heaven. And to survive in that environment, they needed not just two wings, but three sets of wings. With two, they covered their face. 
Strange to me that they had to cover their face. We're not allowed to look and to gaze nakedly into the face of God. You remember Moses on the mountain when he said, Lord, I have seen you do things that no human being has ever beheld in history, but let me have the big one. Show me your glory. Let me see your face. And it's though the Lord condescended to the foolishness of Moses when he said, Moses, you know better than that. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll cut out a crevice here in the rock, and I'll put you there in the rock, and I'll pass by, and I'll let you see my backward parts as I pass by, Moses, but my face shall not be seen. Because no one can see my face and live. Not because we have a weakness in our eyes, but it's because of sin that God remains invisible to us. As our Lord in the Beatitudes promised certain blessings to various people for different things, if, if you were in mourning, God, Jesus promised you that you would be comforted. If you were hungry, you would be satisfied and fed. To whom did he promise the visio day, the vision of God? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's why it is, dear friends, that we will not see God in the pureness of his being until first we are glorified in heaven. But the angels, the seraphim, are daily in his immediate presence. But even them, the brightness, the refulgence of his glory is so intense, the magnitude so high, that it is blinding even to the eyes of the angels. So that the angels have to be equipped with special wings to cover their eyes and with another set of wings to cover their feet. Why? Because they're creatures. Remember when God appeared to Moses out of the burning bush, the first thing he says is, Moses, Moses, put off your shoes from off your feet for the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. And we are described in our creatureliness as having feet of clay. So that our feet symbolize our creatureliness. And in the presence of God, even the angels have to cover their feet. And with the other pair of wings, they flew round about the throne of God. But you know, when you look at this text, it's not the anatomy of the angels that is so striking. It's their message. It's their song that we call the Trishagion, where high above God, the one angel cries to another in antiphonal response, holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord of hosts. The whole earth full of his glory. Why the threefold ascription of holiness? Well, some look at this and they say, well, we believe in the Trinity. And so there's one holy here for each person of the Trinity. It's not just the Spirit who is holy. We call him the Holy Ghost, but the Son is also the Holy One of Israel. And of course, the Father is so holy that holy is his name. And so some see the threefold expression of holy, a reference to Trinity. I don't think that's the case for a minute. 
It certainly is compatible with it, but I don't think that's the reason for it. Rather, there's a more simple explanation for this trishagion. And that is a basic literary structure, a form of communication that was frequently used in Jewish literature and other forms of communication. That is, if you wanted to communicate something that was of great importance and give emphasis to it, the favorite device that the Jews used was the device of repetition. You know, we have all kinds of gimmicks that we use when we're writing or speaking. We can raise our voice, lower our voice. In writing, we can underscore words, put them in italics or in bold print or put a million exclamation points after them if we're completely bankrupt in our vocabulary. (laughs) The Jews had all those methods, but one other one, and that is through simple repetition. Alec Mateer, the British Old Testament scholar who's written a commentary on Isaiah, points out that in the early portion of Genesis, there's an account of battles of kings that get their chariots marred in this pit, and one translation defines the pit as the great pit. Another one calls it the bitumen pit. Another one calls it the asphalt pit. And what is it? A bitumen pit, an asphalt pit, a great pit, or if he's a southerner, a pool pit. First time I heard that, I said, what in the world is a pool pit? You know, I've heard of gravel pits and coal pits, but I've never heard of a pool pit. You had to be there, I guess. (laughs) And Mateer points out that the Hebrew in this particular section is simply the Hebrew word for pit, repeated. But it wouldn't make any sense to an English reader to read that text where it simply says, and they got caught in the pit pit. What in the world is a pit pit? Well, you have to understand that there are pits, and then there are pit pits. A pit pit is the pittiest of all possible pits. (laughs) You may fall into a pit, but what you don't ever want to do is to fall into a pit pit, because chances are if you fall into a pit pit, you'll never get out of it, because it's some kind of a pit. Well, we see this all through the Bible, where emphasis is communicated by repetition. Paul writes to the Galatians, and he says, if anyone preaches any other gospel than that which you have received, let him be anathema. Let him be anathema. Again, I say unto you, if anyone preaches any other gospel, even an angel from heaven, let him be anathema. Take that angel by his celestial seat of his pants and throw him out of the church. He repeats it twice to give emphasis, lest we miss it. Jesus himself will preface his teaching, something that is very important. He'll say, Amen, amen. I say unto you, usually the people say amen after the speech is given. Jesus said amen before he gave his message. Amen, it is true. English translation, truly, truly, I say unto you. And so to communicate the importance of something, the Jew would repeat it. But only once in all of Scripture is an attribute of God ever elevated to the superlative degree, to the third degree. The angels don't just say, beloved, holy is the Lord of hosts. They're not even satisfied with saying, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. But rather... Holy, holy, holy. 
Now again, nowhere does the Bible say that God is love, 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 mercy, 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 grace, 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 righteous, 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 immutable, 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 but that he is holy, holy, holy. There is no higher way for a Jew to express the majesty of God than in this triple ascription of the holy to him. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. There it's Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. I wish we had time to really develop that. I don't. Only to say this, why is it that in our day we have experienced such a tragic eclipse of the knowledge of God the Father. Somebody asked me the question last night about what my greatest concern is for the church. It's still the same as it was 41, 45 years ago when I started ministry. Is that the world out there doesn't know who God is. They know that he is through his general revelation, but they don't know who he is. And the biggest tragedy in the church, in the evangelical church, is that we don't know who God is. If we cut the slightest glimpse of the transcendent majesty of God, our worship would be radically transformed. Our lives would be radically transformed. And yet the whole world is filled with his glory. Why can't we see it? It's just there before your eyes hidden and veiled by our sin. But scratch the surface of any tree, scratch the surface of any person, and you will see the mirror and the reflection of the holy God who made all things. We're surrounded by it. Calvin said we're walking through a magnificent theater that is displaying the holiness of God, but we're like people who put on blindfolds and walk through this arena. But it's right there. Just open your eyes. The foundation of the threshold shook the voice of him who called. The house was filled with smoke. It's like in the middle of the vision Isaiah is experiencing an earthquake or the eruption of a volcano with all of the ash and the dust and the darkness that comes. And when he sees this, he screams. Again, another Hebrew form of communication, very important form of communication, was the prophetic oracle. An oracle was the form by which the word of God was announced through the lips of the prophet. And there were two kinds of oracles. There were oracles of wheel, that is, announcements of prosperity. And the oracle of wheel, of the good news, was prefaced by the words, Blessed, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Or sands is in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law does he meditate every night. To be like a tree planted by rivers of living water, bringing forth its fruit in its season. But the ungodly are not so, but like the chaff that the wind drives away. That's an oracle of wheel. That's good news. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus said. In the Beatitudes, he gives a list of oracles prefaced by the word blessed. But in stark contrast to the oracle of wheel is the oracle of doom, the pronouncement of divine judgment that is prefaced by the word woe. 
Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You go over land and sea to make one convert, and once you have made him, you give him twice the child of hell that you are yourself. In the book of the Apocalypse, at the end, you hear the angel of doom going across the horizon with the bowls of wrath saying, Woe! 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 Again, the threefold. Ultimate expression of judgment. The worst of all possible oracles. But what you have here in Isaiah 6, unprecedented. The woe is not pronounced against the Philistines, against Damascus, but the oracle of woe is pronounced by Isaiah on himself. The very first prophetic oracle the man ever pronounces is an oracle of doom on himself. Woe is me. I am undone. I am destroyed. I'm coming apart. I'm disintegrating. I walked into this situation with the admiration of the people thinking that I'm the paragon of virtue. I was smug in my self-righteousness. I thought I was a pretty good guy, and I catch one glimpse of the nature of God, and it's over. For the first time in his life, Isaiah understood who God was. And for the first time in his life, he understood who Isaiah was. And it destroyed him. If God would reveal the depth of my sin to me in its fullness right now, I couldn't take it. I would die on the spot. So would you. One of the elements of God's grace is the gradual process of sanctification. Thank God he doesn't do it all at once we would be destroyed. And so Isaiah is on his face, confessing his sin. I'm a man of unclean lips. The first thing he was aware of was his filthy mouth. My mouth is dirty. Who knows how he had used the Lord's name? flash forward to the New Testament, and when Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray, and he says, when you pray, pray like this. What's the very first petition he asks his disciples to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, that's the address, the first petition. Hallowed be thy name. That we should be praying that the name of God is treated with reverence, that God is regarded as holy, Do you know how filthy the mouths of our people in our country are with respect to the use of the name of God? As Isaiah realized in this self-revelation that he wasn't the only one with a dirty mouth, he said, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Oh, Isaiah, you have a dirty mouth, do you? Let's see if we can take care of that. And so Adonai sovereignly nodded to one of the seraphs who went over to the altar, white-hot coals burning there, so hot that they would burn even the hands of the angels. The angel had to take a pair of tongs from off the altar to take one piece of that coal and came over to Isaiah, put it on his lips. Do you know why we don't kiss each other with our ears? because there's not the same physiological sensitivity as there is on our lips. Imagine a white, hot, cool coal placed on your lips. I mean, you could hear 
the flesh being burnt from the lips of Isaiah. Was God being cruel? Was God punishing Isaiah by administering this torture of the call on his lips? No, dear friends, not at all. He was healing him. He was cauterizing the wound, cleansing the filthy mouth. And with it, God said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. It's been atoned for, Isaiah. Your sin is being remitted. I'm removing it from you as far as the east is from the west. And he leaves the prophet on his face with blisters on his lips. And then the voice of God is heard in the vision. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And through blistered lips, the forgiven Isaiah says, not here I am, indicating his location, but rather here am I, indicating his surrender. Here am I. Send me. I'll send you. I'll send you. I want you to go to these people and I'm going to make their ears so that they can't hear a word you say. I'm going to make their eyes so blind they won't be able to see what you're doing. I'm going to make their hearts fat lest they turn from their sin and be converted, and be healed. No. I'm not giving you the job of preaching the gospel, Isaiah. But you are to preach my judgment to these people. What? What kind of a ministry is that? And so he says to God, how long do I have to do this? Did you ever say that? until the land is utterly desolate. That's how long. But Isaiah, there's a tithe out there. I have reserved for myself a tenth. I have reserved for myself a people to whom I have given ears to hear and whose eyes I will open and who on the day of judgment will join the seraphims with the song, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. Father, we don't have a fraction of 1% of understanding of your majesty, of your glory, of your transcendent beauty, because you are holy and we are not. Oh, Lord, forgive us in our unholiness and redeem us to yourself. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
We have just heard the greatest of sermons because it is a sermon for which our response is, what an awesome God we serve. The greatest sermons that we preach leave people in astonishment and bewilderment and amazement at the glory of the holiness of the Lord. May we be faithful to use the gift that God has entrusted to us with the purest of motives, with the highest of trajectory, to always lift up and magnify and exalt this God who is holy, holy, holy. What a gravity about the commission that has been entrusted to us. May we always preach of His greatness and may we drink from the deep wells of His glory. We want to take a brief intermission of 15 minutes. We'll be back in here instead of 10.30, let's say 10.35. You'll hear the music, I'm sure. Be sure to come back in as we'll regather and we'll look at the grace of God. God bless you. You're dismissed.